Okay, so um, good morning. System error, C11. It's not whiz bang cool, except it's kind of whiz bang cool. It's not hard, it's very simple. Let's just uh, on, on. Okay, here we go. Okay, so today we've got a lot of content to cover. Now on the bright side, it's a simple talk. The concepts are simple. The takeaways are simple. Just turns out there's a lot of reasons for why it's simple. There is a complicated thing, but it has nothing to do with system error. It has to do with cross-domain semantic mapping. That's hard, sorry. Go find a library to do that. This library is taking a shot at it. So introduction, we're gonna talk a little bit, light and fluffy, arm wavy, get on the same page. What's a message, semantic terms for today? what we cover, don't cover. That's that first section. All the heavy lifting is in two, system error. So we're gonna dig into what do you get in the box, how you're supposed to use it, and in three, we start to talk a little bit about, we're gonna review, but talk a little bit about recommendations. But towards the end, I kind of have you know some discussion on error messages and do's and don'ts, and that's kind of public service stuff. But the heavy lifting is in two, we start a little soft in one, and then we review in three. So we have a lot to cover. That's the wrong direction. Okay, so this is in one, light and fluffy, arm waving. So there are some things we're not really gonna talk about today. And getting on the same page, there are wars, there are holy wars, there are hacker wars, there are message wars. And message alone is a very contentious thing. For some reason, like text editors and other things in the hacker wars, messaging tends to be an issue. We know why, it's because of composition of algorithms. Holy wars, there are a lot of them. We don't talk about that at all today. Hacker wars, there are a lot of them. We're not really going to talk about them today, but editor wars, OS wars, gamer wars, indent style wars, browser wars. We got a lot of wars, but wars are fun. They're neat. We all disagree about various things, and we need to talk about why we disagree. We'll talk about that very briefly. Message wars. Today, we're talking a little bit about messaging system error. How do you want to compose your algorithms? Do you want to explicitly populate them? Do you want to throw? Do you pass in the value to be populated? Do you return the value that you received that was populated for you? So the whole idea on this and why it gets to be a bit contentious is you're talking about composition and increasingly structuring your algorithm within your module, across module boundaries, and within your application. Then ultimately, a lot of this stuff has to somehow route to you know, some user's face or a log or something. There are a lot of technologies there, system log and stuff. So we're gonna have to kind of bound some of the discussion to what system error gives you. And system error really is only talking about you forming messages in your code, that's it. So clarity, correctness, constraints, personal taste. There's a lot of reasons to disagree on messaging. It can be very contentious. So disagreement. We do have wars because we disagree. If you disagree because you misunderstand, that's not good, you should try to understand. If you disagree because we have conflated terms, we have defined this one term to mean two different concepts, sometimes it's really hard to tease out what you're speaking about. And that's where we start to fight a little bit more. But there is legitimate disagreement. Legitimate is we wanna compose our systems in a usable way that's expressive for the library implementer and then ultimately for the user. And then we wanna also actually handle you know, branch logic, the pessimistic scenario. An error happened, what do I do? as the library author or even as the user. So composing and handling, those are gonna be things we ought to get to agreement on as best we can. So, you know, just a quick blast from the past. 1803, Michigan and Ohio almost went to war with each other for real, they raised militias and they were really mad for like 30 years, Toledo went back and forth. And well, that was a long time ago and they fought because, you know, they disagreed. Pastry war, that's a personal favorite. Um, 1838 to 1839, uh, French King Louis Philippe invades Mexican City because he learned that 10 years prior there was a pastry chef's cafe that got you know ransacked by mobs. So he sent in the army, they went in and killed a bunch of soldiers, and then the Mexicans, Mexicans had to pay. That's a decade later after it actually happened. So that was a good war. Here's War of the Stray Dog, October 1925. A Greek soldier was following his dog across the border to the next country over, and then they shot him. So then, you know, we rallied a bunch of guys, took a bunch of towns, and you know, these are like misunderstandings. The guy was chasing his dog, and all of a sudden people are dead. So there's misunderstandings, and this, you know, this is last month. Um, North Korea fires a projectile was the headline. No, 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 there was a missile in their Day of the Sun parade for the first time. And so the headline was corrected and you know China got all excited. So we do these misunderstandings all the time. Even with the internet, with information so fast, we can misunderstand each other at the speed of light now. Okay, so conflating. 
mixing. We have a status result kind of thing, and we have a message kind of thing. We want to separate the terms a little bit. So message. You want messages generally, and it's going to, it's going to talk about there was a state change in the system that was important. Or there was an event that occurred and that was important. Something happened and I better tell somebody. Maybe I can handle it, but if I can't, I'm going to throw or do something and somebody better say or do something. So the whole point of messaging is to provide visibility. In the case of a failure scenario, that's actionable information. You know, sometimes I have successful operations and I continue on my merry way. Sometimes I have unsuccessful operations and that's actionable. So I want to conditionally branch and do other things. Conditional processing, maybe I'll log also based on that failure scenario. And then of course, exception. Exception means the function didn't return, you halted progress, you know, your stack unwinding, maybe even call terminate eventually. So message and error and exception, we're composing and how a function finishes. So here's a function and it, we're C++, right? We have a lot of power. Foo, we call foo, how will it finish? And for right off the bat, we have the successful and failure case, the function executed, the function returned, any values on the stack that were handed to me are handed back. Maybe I have some conditional processing because there's a failure scenario or a success scenario. We, we don't have to finish. It could throw an exception. The function does not return. It does a stack unwind, right? And it could also call to terminate or something. The function could just abort the system. So it doesn't have to return. And of course, we have the new system, which is it suspends, right? So there's, there's discussion with coroutines. I notice that the author is in the room. But we're essentially talking about functions process, and then they kind of give you something back, but they may be resumable later. So we have these different ways of composing functions now, and this is going to have to be multiplexed with how you set up your systems, your modules, your cross-module domain kind of mapping. But it also, this is also how we're going to feed back messages across systems. So, you know, it's a little bit rich, but that's good. We like rich for C++. So success. Yes, I talked to the module and it loaded. Now the second one here, I successfully invoked a call, talked to the module, the module's up, the module's mad, the configuration failed to load. That's a success. I did establish communication. I know the status of that module. So even though bad things might be going on, it's still a successful scenario. Whereas, you know, if it just times out, then I, then I don't know. I don't really know where we're at. So success and failure is there. Uh, we suspend, here's where we are now, we might resume later. We do not complete, well, throw an exception or program termination. We're going to use this, of course, to compose our stuff. So conflating. If you want to have a function that returns a stood string because you don't have a message system, well, I'll just return a string. And actually, there are a tremendous number of systems like this, right? Well, well is the string like an error or a message or a warning? Or, well, you know, parse the string, and if you see the word error, it's probably an error. If you see the word warning, and, and there are a lot of... There are a lot of binding libraries that are basically doing this to parse console output or something, and if, if that line has the word error anywhere on it, that line turns red, right? A lot of our IDEs work like that. They, they bridge in from all these tools, and they're doing some heuristic processing on a string, and they're making you know, higher level heuristic conclusion based on the contents of. Contents don't have to be documented. Anybody can do whatever they want. But if everybody follow convention, it tends to work pretty well. So some of the non-statically typed languages or some of the open-ended libraries, that's an API. You can really use that API. It's just based on convention more than strict static typing, which, you know, we generally like static typing. So logging. The reason we war over this is because we don't agree on a lot of stuff. It's a mess. We have to use it, but we're mad we have to use it because there's so many technologies in many, many of our code bases. How many messaging systems are in there? It's not one, it's like three or five or more. And it's because people are adding ways to route information back to the user or to the log or to different de destinations. But it's also because we have different requirements. Some of this stuff has to be low latency handling. And some of this stuff has to be like, stop now and continue on. So sometimes we legitimately have multiple systems in the libraries we compose or in our you know, shipping integrated package because we have differing requirements and those messaging systems, multiple show up because they're serving different needs. So logging, I'm, I'm now waving my arms on logging versus messaging. So you know, there's kind of a body there a big ball you can kind of imagine. Logging is necessary, logging is helpful, and logging is disallowed. And this is about the scale we're working at. Necessary, most of the time. Helpful, quite often it is additionally helpful. 
and disallowed. There are systems where logging or messaging is kind of disallowed, right? So for example, a, a small little thing with no memory footprint and no display output and tight latency requirements, you know, we don't even have any time to log here. So little microcontrollers maybe don't log, but you've seen this scale before, we all have. That scale is the sun, the moon, this is earth where logging is helpful and disallowed is the $100,000 tool bag dropped by an astronaut in 2008 that kind of drifted off. So we're all logging it and we're all dealing with logging systems. Let's talk about message real quick. It's a definition of terms problem. It's serving multiple needs. The word message is overloaded, heavily overloaded. So we have messaging frameworks and, you know, different people have different things. For me, messaging always meant I'm, I'm doing like cross thread or cross process notification of some kind. You know, that's, that's kind of a messaging thing, but we have all these serialization and tracing libraries and frameworks and electronic messaging with email and fax and stuff. And, and there's more, there are, a lot, there are a lot of things that are out here, like other programming languages like, like Scheme and Lisp, they do inner object messaging and that's not really on here. Intel's got their um, MPI, their messaging, their message passing interface across CPUs to do coordination. Well, that's not on here. I mean, there's a lot of messaging we're talking about, but today we're just drilling in on a very specific one. We're going to talk very briefly about the two common overloads that, that programmers see. They're message frameworks. I want to say this thing, and it's going to route somewhere through the great magic into a log file or into front of you, user's eyeballs. It has nothing to do with this today. We are talking really about messages in our code. That's what system error gives you. Hey, I, I have a text string that I want to go somewhere. Well, how does it get there? Not my problem. We're just talking specifically in system error about how to embed it in your code and how the frameworks are going to hook up. So that's specifically this here today. And you know, it's a little bit, it's not surprising, but it's a little bit surprising that all system error is doing is letting you compose domain specific content that you can hand off to somebody else that they can have a look at and through static typing, they can make conditional branching and composition decisions across modules, across systems. And runtime loadable, I mean, it's all like, like all the magic that we ever wanted. But it's not, it's not syslog, it's not your event notification system. You gotta go bring that yourself. Whatever your system is, you, you bring that in. We're just talking about composing statically typed messages that map across domain. That's the hard concept. It's not the library, it's not the problem of system error that, hey, you know what? Um, I've looked at this problem a lot, and I have somehow concluded that cross-domain semantic mapping is hard. Well, yeah, sorry. I mean, it, the, the problem is hard. The library is giving you a solution, but you'll ultimately in the domain have to do the semantic mapping. So we'll talk about that in a second. So terms, if you're pedantic, the message is gonna be, here's this, this content body thing, that's the message. There's the event that triggers that message. You know, I, I ran over the code and I wanna, create the message and send it off. There's the instance, which is the created thing that kind of runs off. And you know, there are terms here, you can kind of review it, but you kind of intuitively already know this stuff. But what we're gonna conflate, and I'm gonna intentionally conflate, event notification, that's really what we're talking about today. It's not really messaging. We're talking about event notification. So today, mostly event notification. Messaging your code, system error loves you. It wants to help you. It has things for you. Your logging framework, syslog or whatever, on your own. Bring it yourself, figure it out, get your own constraints. But today we're basically talking about event notification. And here's an example of why. So here's a little axis of speed versus volume. We have quadrants. Different apps have different tolerances. So most apps might be in one place. Some apps have very specialized needs for, I really need low latency or I have to offload this off this thread. You know, whatever your requirements are, and this, this is big, this is a hard world. System error has nothing to do with this at all. You, you go, go find your architecture, establish your requirements, plug in your systems, and most code bases have like two or three event systems or more, sometimes a lot more. Uh, this would be a similar thing, kind of the same look. So if you had a network controller, the network controller itself is kind of bifurcated into a couple parts. So on the data plane side, you wanna do event notification there. But the event notification there is ultimately talking about a side effect of data flow processing. It's not about the system state. It's about the state of data flows within the system. So that's kind of the data plane. And you're gonna have low latency requirements. You have a lot more tolerance on the control plane side. That is talking about system state. What modules are loaded is the thing on fire. So 
even the requirements within one product are just fundamentally going to change. So that's a little bit. That's the end. We're going to talk about event notification. Go get syslog. Go get a framework. Go find something to help you. So let's get specific. Sig Sev 11. So somewhere out there, like in signal.h, somebody did 11 is associated with this, this thing called Sig Sev. Somebody out there, who knows where, could be in siglist.h, did this init sig, and they tied this, this, this token, which we know to be 11, to this little string here, which is, in this case, segmentation fault. It's out there, it's defined. We would kind of call that a message definition, right? It's, it's a defined message. Is it an instance? No, it hasn't happened yet. It might happen. Boom, it happened. You ran your program, and you get this string here that looks suspiciously similar to this string here. So, OK, that would be a message instance. It happened. We somehow present it to the user or a log or someplace. Somebody maybe performed conditional processing. In this case here, it was associated with the program ended. If you instrument it with Valgrind or something, you might also start to associate message instance specific attributes fields. The world of structured logging is a big logging world where you start tying key value pairs to the message itself. So we have tools to do that, and that would be a message instance with payload, right? So the message event occurs, the event notification is there, the event message may have instance specific key value stuff if you're doing structured logging. But you know, that's kind of the point of we triggered a message from a definition to an instance, boom, it ended up somewhere. So today, we're largely saying event notification is the arm waving thing that we're talking about. It, it can drill into a lot of specific areas. What are these messages? Error codes and messages, there's a contrast between I need an identifier, a way to say at this line and or at this file and line number, maybe that's the only way I have to identify the message that occurred. Or at this unique identifier, this message code, that is the error that occurred. It may have been invoked from one of five different places in my system. So those are going to be the contrast between the codes and the message definitions themselves. So a message, in our case, an error message, it, you know, a lot of times people call all messages error messages. They might be informational. They might be warning. They might be, you know, like trace or verbose additional information to give the user some indication as to what's going on. Oh, that's an error message. Well, you know, it might technically not be an error message, but, you know, that's the arm wavy conflation of terms. So the message is the content or the definition of content. The code is the identifier. And there's a lot of wars based on how that identifier ought to behave. Where did it come from? How much work is it to put in place? So when you don't have an identifier, the whole string itself becomes the identifier, effectively. Sometimes we can wimp out because we're developers talking to developers. The file and line number becomes the identifier where it was, the place from which it was invoked. That's what your compiler uses, ultimately, to say, hey, bad thing here. So examples in code. OK, so let, let's pretend I want to say error comma value must be between 1 and 20. That's what I want the output to be. So we're going to have a bunch of examples to get the exact same text out. Well, for starters, I could just embed all that. Here's a string literal, error comma, value must be between 1 and 20. You know, I can just type that. I have the power to do that. I can put anything I want in there, and boom, out it goes. Now, of course, we know that you've embedded your literals, right? It's kind of hard to maintain that. So we, we often pull the literals out, right? I, I might want to have like a local variable or some kind of context so that error comma value must be between lower bound and upper bound. OK, so that, that might be a little bit of an improvement. Well, we could just do it with printf. Printf, error comma, and then we've got this little string format that we're going to substitute values into. And as you start out putting more and more fields, the, the streaming format gets to be unwieldy and kind of hard to maintain. So people like Python, they've kind of moved to embedding stuff, and they're using the curly braces. So in this case here, well, well with fprintf, I'm not just going to the console. I can specify the file to which I'm going. So in this case, I'm going to standard out. Maybe I go to a file or a log file or something. So I'm, I'm pulling more things out to where the code is actually getting more reusable, and I'm using more environmental context to establish local specific reasoning regarding bounds and destination. So how far can we go? Well, here, instead of embedding the word error in the message, I'm going to now have a statically typed enumerated value. Let's just call it error. And now this message here, it's kind of been promoted to the category of all things which are of this enumerated type, error, as opposed to a different enumerated type, like info or warning or verbose. 
And then of course we pulled these things out. We've kind of gone to a different little format here. This is sort of the Python-y thing of they're embedding these little values and they have little field specifiers. There's a really good C++ library called FMT on GitHub for free. I think the author is kicking around sticking into C++ standards, but it basically does this in your C++ code. Okay, so now we're going a little bit further. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. New change here. I've semantically broken out the level of the error as error being distinct from warnings or infos or verboses or whatever else. But I've also removed the string. The string is no longer there. So I'm going to need to have some way to identify, well, you know, here's the, the content or the context of the message definition that I want to invoke. And now we have what looks to be probably something a lot like an enum. And as it turns out, that's an enum. And of course, we still left out our lower and upper bounds. So we can do localized context reasoning and you don't have to recompile as you change your mind. And then of course, now we're continuing it further. We no longer pull out error as an enumerated level. We now say, well, I'm, I'm gonna say that I, I want that. I want all the error things and all the warning things and all the info things and all the verbose things and all these different categories of things that might be the message. I want those categorizations, but I'm putting those as an attribute off of this enumerated value. And in this case, maybe I've put the name there, but it, you know, the template metaprogramming guys, we, we all know how to do that. We can tie it into the enum itself, or we can have external attributes associated with that enum value that map to one of you know, those enumerated levels. So at this point, you'll notice the, the, the text the programmer types starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Down here, they can't have any misspelling errors. You know, you either got it to compile or you didn't. We took out of control of the programmer the ability to use words like, I don't know, are there profane words in your source code base? I've seen them show up in front of customers. So I have a story about that. It's very end if we can get to it. So this, you know, ultimately this bottom one is kind of what we want. Like, I, I don't want to know anything. I'm trying to get work done. I want to compose my stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got to throw like a message to somebody. Just let me pick any new. If I have to do instance specific values, I'll throw those there because I have to. I've got localized context reason. Nobody else has that. I do. But, you know, this is about the best we're going to do. We're not going to get better than this. And, you know, the very, very, very best we could do is, you know, maybe there's no, there's no local state. We'll just throw the enum. Okay, well, that's going to be system error. So all of these, and we kind of went through it, but this will go fast. Infinite power granted to the intern. Intern can type anything intern wants there, and it shows up in front of the customer's eyeballs. Well, with great power comes great responsibility. You're going to have to do a lot more vigorous review of code changes and spelling errors. And we've had a lot of cases actually where people will post process through customer specific, you know, scripts and stuff, error messages that you've provided. So when you, two years later, fix the spelling error that's been there for two years, all their scripts are broken and they hate you. So then you revert that change and you have to keep spelling things incorrectly just so that the customers don't get broken. So generally, we want to type as little as possible. These two here, we've pulled out with the second one, the programmer does have the ability to supply upper and lower bounds, but through localized reasoning as opposed to literals. We like that. Here, the programmer is doing that, but this is you know, compose a little bit better, but the programmer, really what that's doing is the programmer's got a local override. Yeah, 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 I know this message exists, but in my context, it's an error. Maybe in your context, that similar message, maybe it's a warning, maybe it's informational. But I, the programmer, I have local override. That's what that is, it's giving me power. So here, I have the ability to pick one of the ones that are defined, maybe provide some local upper and lower bounds, and I can do an override for what is the context here. And then of course, this is kind of the simple. I just pick a message and say, you know, throw this or output that or send this value back to the caller. So generally the takeaway here is you don't want programmers to have to do a lot of work and make override decisions because that's a maintenance point. Maintaining enums with static type checking is generally a lot easier. So invoking a message, you want to identify the message and, and if their feed value was seg fault, Hey, look, seg fault, message. There's no field specific values, so it just goes out. But if there are field values, if you're doing field instances specific to your message, that's where that would be useful. It's kind of nice to be able to override log level or destination maybe, like, oh, I want to go to console, I want to go to file, maybe. 
And message defining, sometimes you want to actually define messages locally at the point where I want to define the message and invoke the message because that's where I'm thinking about it. It kind of harms reuse a little bit, but it's very locally reasonable. And of course, if you define them locally, then it's harder to get reuse. So, you know, these are, these are all things that you have to consider. And then messaging generally means string manipulation. String manipulation is expensive. Your latency is going to go up. So you may want to insert or not insert it through a compile preprocessor directive. But basically, this is the best we're going to do. I'm going to say, you know, send to my log or send a syslog or something that enum. Uh, you're not going to get better than that. And, and if you want instance specific values, send that enum message and maybe these specific locally reasoned values. You're not going to get better than that. That's, that's the best we're going to do. OK, well, then somebody's got to define that stuff. So somewhere, somewhere out there, somebody's going to have to create the enum. Well, enums, right? We can make enums. We have strong enums now. That's kind of cool, too. And then you're going to have to have a vector table or something of, of the string messages themselves, it, it, assuming you actually want to format them somewhere. So this has to exist, and we have to map that to this. And that's what system error does. There are a lot of ways to get there, but system error is one. System error, C++11, it's based on the work coming out of the ASIO networking and file system TSs for C++ for a long time. And it made it into C++. 11, so you have system error, but if you don't have that because you're on 03, no problem, boost, ASIO, they have full implementations of system error ready to rock. So you'll see about that in a second. So what is it? It's two things. The first is, it's just an adapter interface. System error, what is it? Well, you know, it's that um, statically typed value that I can create and populate and hand to the user or hand to the other library or hand to somebody. And it's going to be a non lossy transform of localized context that gives me Enough information by which the caller can do conditional processing. That's, that's the whole goal. Here's enough info so that you go figure it out. I don't know what your context is. I just know I couldn't open the file. Or I just couldn't connect that to the, to the network or something. So it's an adapter interface if you follow the semantics. And it also actually is an implementation mechanism. You don't have to write any code. You can actually just start using it. Oh, um, let's go look at the standard errors. There are a bunch of them. They're the POSIX error C errors, really. So the POSIX errors, you start using them. You can throw them. You can return them. You can populate them. Just use this um, stood uh, error code, and, and you're ready to go. You don't have to write anything. It gives you a whole tooling framework that's ready to go. But the POSIX stuff tends to be really popular in some platforms. Windows has got the get last error. They use, they use the error no for the C APIs, but they've got the get last error also. And then, well, your library, you're doing your own thing. You might have your own errors. That's totally fine. Osio implemented a bunch of stuff that's Osio specific. That's totally fine. And then other languages, Rust or Go or Python or Haskell. Or, you know, you got weird runtime modules that are loading and they're evoking errors. Why would they do that? Well, you know, you want that stuff to get mapped into an object that we can all pass around in our APIs that basically agrees it compiles so they don't have to, I can just relink. I don't have to recompile. So yes, standard error is your non-lossy transport mechanism for localized reason context. That's it. That's why we want to use it. You can write your own, but your own will end up looking a lot like it. So then here's our stuff. We don't even have to relink in a lot of cases. Oh, that's the other way. What's in the box? It's not a big header. If you are a user, there is one thing called error code. You should use it. In fact, you don't have to make the decision. The library writer will give you one. And you just look at it and say, hi, how are you? And you talk to it. And it'll tell you, I'm upset. And then, well, what's your string? How upset are you? And then it'll say, well, here's my string. And it's so easy. You can't do much with it. If you're a library auth, you've got to populate those things. You do that by extending, by deriving from error category. And there is this thing called system error. That's if you want to throw an exception with error code as payload. So if you're throwing, you like system error. It's just throwing an error code as payload. You derive from category to create your domain. An error condition, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but most people kind of don't need to know about it. There's the POSIX errors defined in that strong enum error C. There's some other stuff like you know hashing and checking and comparing stuff. There's some utility things in there, but you basically don't care. It, it, it'll just work. OK, so where can you get it? Well, 11 and beyond, you already have it. 03, you just pull one of these headers here. Osio, you know, they've got macros to basically say, I'm in boost, I'm not in boost, I'm separate, I want to use the standard error, I want to use the Osio error. So you, there's compile time configuration manipulation to pick kind of what you, ones you want. But if you're going forward, you probably just want to use uh, std error code. But here are all the mappings from to, from to. Everybody has it today, right now. Other way. OK, how are you going to use it? You're going to make an enum. You're not going to get better than that. 
and you're gonna have to make a string table. You probably want that unless you don't wanna say anything to the user because you're a jerk. And then you're gonna somehow invoke it with your logging system or populate an error code. So error category is this. Category, if, if it were me, I would have renamed it to domain. It'd be error domain. That's probably a better word. But category is, yeah, 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 here are all the errors that I'm talking about, and then we're gonna invoke them straight off the enum. How does it work? I wanna type this, because I can't get better than that. It's a compile time static you know, catch if I do something wrong. And it's gonna map to this. And you're probably not gonna get better than that. So it's magic, but it's doing this, this design mechanism, it's, it's a pattern, we use it a lot. Call it handling context, you can call it something else. So an example, std thread. I'm main, I am a thread, I got invoked, I'm a thread. And then, oh, oh, I wanna make a thread, I wanna make another, I got three threads now. Yeah, but what is T0? And, and before you answer, hint, it's not a thread. What is it? It's a handle. There somewhere out there is a platform specific implementation of whatever a thread is and T0 is gonna be a handle to it. You can always know when it's a handle when you do the size of, of it. What size of T0? Well, it's gonna be eight or 16, it's gonna be little. You know, well, you know, threads have like, like a thread name of like two and it's got a thread stack and it's got a lot of stuff in it. Well, you're not gonna fit all that stuff in eight. That stuff is somewhere else. There's a, there's a control block or payload or something somewhere else, because T0 is just a handle. So T0 is a handle, T1's a handle. It's a handle to an implementation-defined thread. That's how it's cross-platform. That's how it's statically typed, and we can bridge up and not even recompile, we just relink and go. What pattern is this? Well, we know what pattern is. It's the handle in the context. And uh, wh wh where's the context? Anybody want to shoot at it? Okay, it's a handle. It's a handle in a context. Where is the context? Any guess? The problem is you already know, and it's so intuitive you wouldn't say it out loud. It's the current process. Thread cheats. It says, look, you want to create a thread, another thread, 10 threads. You know, it's going to give them unique names to each of those threads. It's going to allocate resources. This is kind of a budgeted thing coming in from the operating system or some framework. So somebody out there is governing this thing that is all threads. And they did that through a process singleton or some kind of process context to where all these handles are coordinated behind the scenes in a context. And the context, you don't see the context. And it ultimately, it's because the context is internal to the handle. I can create a handle and it knows the context for free. I don't have to give it a context. So standard thread is cheating because the context is at process level. It's, it's a process singleton or something at process level. Okay, window. So, you know, on the fast track to C++ 2037, we'll get windows and window zero, window one. And then at the end of the program, they're closed. Return the return values. What is zero? It's not a window. What is it? Well, how big it is. You know, that, it'll be size eight or size of a pointer, size of an int or something. And it's gonna be a handle. This is the same as thread. We're gonna, we're, this is how we solve a lot of problems. And what pattern is this? It's the handle and context pattern. You know, where's the context? It's gonna be the same as thread. Where is it? Well, the context is gonna be process level. So all the windowing systems, in fact, a lot of them, most of them for historical reasons, since they were built in the Unicore days, most of the, most of the GUI stuff has to be on the main thread. They can't even be on a sub-thread. That's how they solve their cross-thread contention kind of problem by saying, look, let's just throw all the GUI on the main thread. And that way, there's only one main thread. So that's how they resolve the context internal to the handle. They just don't allow cross-thread manipulation. So the cute libraries and you know, windows and stuff, there's a lot of things that kind of give main threads special ability, special power, special context to make decisions because you need a context coordinating stuff. Okay, so let's review the pattern. There is a context. Actually, the context comes before the handle. There is a context. It might be a singleton like process level, maybe. You know, that's what, you know, kind of the Windows things are doing or the thread things are doing. There may be more than one. A handle is constructed within a given context. So if I have a handle, it's associated with, the, for a thread, it's easy, the context of the whole process. And the handle's meaningless outside the context. Now, now, in this case, the context is the process. So it's kind of hard for me to screw up for thread or window or, or you know, patterns at the, at the process level. That's why it's easy. That's why people cheat and go there. System maintains design invariance within the context. The heavy lifting is not done in the handle. 
The handle is a value semantics, lightweight little thing that I can pass around by value or reference, whatever. All the heavy lifting is in the context. Somebody somewhere implemented design invariance that they're maintaining as handles come and go, as shared resources and contention occurs. The context is doing all the work. Now in a minute, we're gonna substitute, context is gonna become domain, and domain is where all the coordination is gonna occur. The handles don't do the work, the domain does the work. So we maintain divine, design invariance and other things through the context. So allocators, I did this one because, you know, he's fun to listen to, this was a great talk, but also it's an example of the context being external to the handle. So in this case, uh, the allocators that were presented a couple years ago uh, at CPPCon, really good talk. Using my allocator equal, he had composable allocators. I want to allocate like this with a fallback allocator. He composed up all these allocators, and in the end, boom, that's the allocator I want. And you just start using it. And okay, well, I'm going to A dot allocate. Boom, you got one. You got a handle to a thing that's yours. Until later, you give it back. I'm saying, well, that allocator better own the handle I got from it and then I will later return the handle back to it, and that's gonna be the free or the deallocate, and then explain in the talk the deallocation mechanism and why that's there. But essentially, this was interesting and powerful in part because I can have many contexts. I want many allocators. I want many compositional allocation policies that I would like to employ for different reasons. And so in that case, you're gonna have an allocator, which is the context external to the handle. So anyway, that's, that's kind of fun and neat. Why do we do it? Well, <laughs> we do this a lot. This is a pattern in a lot of code. We already saw it for thread and windows and stuff. The allocators did it. But it's because it's lightweight object manipulate. It's hard to screw up a handle. You get a handle, you play with it, you kill it, whatever you do with it. You can't really hurt people because all the heavy lifting is off in the domain. It's off in the context. Object reuse is desired. Maybe we want to amortize the cost of expensive allocations and deallocations. And a lot of times you want control. I'm only going to let you have so many threads. I'm only going to let you have so many windows. I'm only going to let the address space go so big. And of course, that's always going to be the case for hardware, right? I'm only going to let you have this card because it's there or these ports or these addresses because this is the pool available. And once you exceed what's physically on the machine, I have a control mechanism to say, no, you got a handle back, but it's a bad handle. It's, handles are easy for users to use. They're kind of a pain in the butt to implement if you're the author, but they're very easy for users. That's why we use them, and they allow for a lot of features and amortization. Okay, so I'm throwing this in there because you use it, and there's so much use of shared pointer. It's a handle in context. So you have a shared pointer. We all know that's not the object. It's a handle to the object. There's a control block somewhere, and, and maybe many shared pointers are sharing that same resource on the back end. And the context is going to be the control block and the object itself. And we have all these handles sharing that thing. It's why it's in the name, shared pointer. And so we've got a weak pointer that's a non-owning handle. So in this case, we have owning handles and non-owning handles. And of course, the context is internal to the handle because I, I can just say shared pointer, I made one, and later on shared pointer just goes away or I can kill it myself. And the context will clean up, but the context is internal to the handle. The caller has no job or responsibility to, to coordinate that. Whereas like Alexandrescu's allocators, the onus is on the user to do that. So anyway, there you go. One to many, this is a really powerful pattern. Every time my brain gets full and things get restricted or controllable or you know, hardware based or whatever, it's a kind of a handy way to go to an open-ended architecture because essentially I have a lot of the great unwashed doing application code, playing with handles, but they're only using handles to the power that we gave them. All the heavy lifting is in the context which I've controlled. And you can iterate and, and manipulate and evolve the context. So in this case here, system error, you can, it's, it's this pattern. You can really abuse this pattern a lot, because you can put anything you want in the context. So we'll see some examples of that towards the end. Okay, so we're familiar with this pattern, handles to some context, coordinating state. Uh, it's light and fast, simple to use, you know, it's controlled. It, it, there is secret stuff going on in the context. It's a little bit opaque, but you know, that's a feature. I would like the hardware to often be opaque. I don't want users to know. So the system error design is this design, the magic is this context thing. Some poor slob, some poor sucker, some library author has to implement that. And we're going to rename the word context to domain in a second. So shared coordination of module-specific error messages, module-specific domains. At runtime, we want all these modules to interoperate. They were not compiled in the presence of each other. They're going to interoperate statically through the type system without even 
relinking or, or runtime linking because everybody agrees on the static type. This is the hardest thing and users don't care, only the library author cares. Somebody somewhere has to define a domain. So you're gonna probably have more domains than you think. You don't have to, you have one big one. You just use the ones that are given to you. But we all have local specific weird things that occur. So we end up defining our own application specific domains. The category is an aggregation of what? Of messages. You can have as many categories as you want. You can have as many messages as you want per category. You're gonna to have to kind of map that logically out. But ultimately this is the domain. Error category is error domain. I would prefer a name change. Stood error category is an abstract base. We'll derive from it. You're probably gonna have more than one. Small systems, one is fine. You know, small systems, you know, zero is fine. You already got one given to you by system error. Essentially, they're all the error C POSIX stuff. But you might end up defining them for local specific reasoning. So all the things that are dealing with my system, or maybe just IO, or maybe system monitoring, or maybe device network configuration, or maybe fluidics operations, these are all subdomains within your domain. And sometimes it behooves you to break out little subcategories just for sub reasoning about your domain specific conditional processing. Here's what you get out of the box for free. There are four and they're there because the standards group just loves you, doggone it. This is error C, enum class error C, strong enum C++11. It is presented to you through this thing called error category. It returns a const ref to the process level singleton of a std error category. So generic category has all the error C, the, the POSIX stuff. You can look through them and you know, they're probably familiar to a lot of you. There's a IO stream category. It's only got like one thing called stream. Oh, uh, your stream is bad. That's it. Is anything bad? No. What's bad? Your stream. That's it. That, that's all you got. Uh, there's a future error category. There's a few enums there. And then there's system error. And it's deliberately open-ended. You'll get at it through system category. So you can call std error category, returns a const ref to the process level singleton, which is a, you know, an error category. And it'll be some OS specific or platform specific or domain specific implementation of whatever codes they thought were important. A lot of times these will map to generic category. That, that just seems to be interesting. If you have a file open problem on one OS, you might have the same file open problem on a different OS, so you can probably map it both to the common idea of the file failed to open. So this is platform specific, but that mapping, that's the hard thing. And nobody needs to know, certainly users don't need to know, sometimes library authors need to know. You define a domain, oh, oh, you have error codes? Do, do like any of your error codes map to these error codes? That's the hardest thing you'll have to do. Okay, so you can get them. Generic category, system category, IO stream category, future category. Those are the four you get for free out of the box. They're in there right now. So if you want to create local variables that are const refs to those static process level singletons, boom, there they are. Hey, give me your name, give me your name. Give, they all have a name. Okay, so an error category, because you're going to make your own. You get four, but you get, make, get to make your own. Every error category, it's a process level singleton. We're cheating. We're doing what standard thread does. It has a name. Hey, what's your name? It'll tell you. You'll, you'll, you'll pick a name, define a name, whatever you want. And it'll be a collection of your messages. And some of them are pretty darn wimpy, like IO Stream's got like one, one message. So that's it. Error number, error no. I'm just bringing it up because it's a very common parallel to uh, how a lot of people think about errors. And, and it kind of maps to get less error in Windows also. Essentially what's going on is we have a thread local value that gets populated sometimes. So it's, it contains an error number of the last error code generated. So it, it's gonna be specific to a thread, right? Because they're all blasting through, creating their own problems. The value is set to zero at startup and by convention, you know, for, for decades, and probably you wanna follow this convention, zero means no error. Non-zero, positive, negative, whatever you wanna do. Non-zero means, yeah, yeah, I got an error. I probably have a message for you. So that's gonna be our convention. We're gonna follow that through. So you, it gets overwritten. So sometimes I'll call functions and error no gets overwritten. So here's an example. So I wanna do my little open on that file and you know, there's some attributes and stuff. If I don't get a file descriptor back, huh, something, something bad probably happened. Hey, you know, I'll check error no. So I'll check the little thread local value. Is it, you know, 
eno ent, no such file or directory. And now I can say, oh, okay, no such file or directory. You know what, there's, there's even like a little function. Hey, um, give me like the string version of that value and it will print it out for you. It's not thread safe, but it'll print it out for you. And C libraries, this is you know, how all the C libraries tend to behave. I mean, through legacy reasons. Integer values for errors, not even an enum, but integer values. And then they'll give you a function that formats it to a string oftentimes. There it is. Um, get last error, Windows will populate error node too, but only for the C stuff. Otherwise they've got their own thing because they've got their own you know, system specific errors and issues to show up. So the value's overwritten during run, don't forget to check it. It's kind of not thread safe on some of the formatting, but you're generally gonna wanna start using error code. It's a, it's a superior mechanism than this because this is the local context of the current thread, right? Which is kind of not safe to access. Um, Torvalds doesn't like error no, and there's some discussion there as to why I think it's a failed thing, but we, we deal with it because it's a legacy design and a lot of the C libs that we bring in, they're sitting on either error no or another version of the same thing. Okay, Osio, what'd they do? Well, osio has got four categories. So Osio, now it's not a strong enum. They, Osio learned to be C++03 compatible. So strong enums weren't there till 11. So Osio has this thing called basic errors, which is domain specific for their concern. And then, oh yeah, yeah, I got some NetDB errors. I got some adder info errors. I got some misc errors. Make as many domains as you want. That's what Osio gives you. And you can get at them. Give me the, now Osio chose uh, the, the, the std functions just have the name. Osio uses get. So get system category, get miss category, get adder info, get net DB category. That's, that's what I, now when you write your own category, you're gonna need to write a function, use get or not, it's kind of cute. Okay, without a doubt, this is the number one confusion about system error. Why do you have this error code thing, which everybody should use? Look at this, see that, know it, love it. Air condition, it looks very similar. It's the same interface, but users don't need to know it exists. It's there for a specific reason and it's static type checking and we'll see that in a second. But the summary is error code is platform specific non-lossy. You want platform specific non-lossy in your APIs, across your API binary. You always want that. You never need this except for lazy last moment at the point of reasoning. So air conditioning is local reasoning. We'll get to that in a second. But review, platform specific. It means it's inconsistent across platforms because it's specific to this platform. So there may be other platforms and this may be different. Sorry. Platform independent. It's consistent across platforms. I want every platform to basically behave the same or similarly. So the ability to contrast these two things is the reason we have error code and error condition. We can talk about design evolution if we want, but that's why it is there today. And we're now gonna say, when I, when I say platform specific, platform independent, it's really domain specific, domain independent. If you wanna say the domain of Linux, you can, the domain of Windows, you can, the domain of Mac, you can, but you know, oftentimes it's the domain of my fluidics control subsystem. And, 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 and sometimes the OS or the deployment hardware is a, is a domain by itself. So let's pretend every message, it has an identifier and we're just gonna kind of call them messages and this is my arm waving thing about error codes, error values, message ID, message values, message instances. They're actually kind of important, but we're gonna arm wave today because you don't care. You're just gonna return an enum, set an enum and compare, compare against an enum. You're not gonna get better than enum. That, that's the best we're gonna do. Okay, so why do we have this design? Why did they do that? The, the ASIO network and file system TS is evolving from 03 and beyond and into 2011. Why did they do this design? And this is why they did the, this is why the design showed up. In the olden days, in the beginning, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have like the hallowed people in robes with torches will form a committee and they're going to say, thou shalt be the standard error codes and they will enumerate them out. And everybody will just use them. Now, now we know that you know, some domains are really pretty specific. So we know, you know people that we don't like will have to create their own error codes also for local reasoning. But what they should do is when they can, and they can't always, we accept, but when they can, they should map the local ones into the common ones. That's what we should do. And it turns out that doesn't work. And that's why this design is there. Standard message codes 
failed as a mechanism and mostly as that second statement, as a common form of exchange state. And the reason for that is local reasoning was lost. We did a lossy discard. Anytime, 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 anytime you map from this domain to that domain, I don't care how you did it, anytime you map, it's a lossy discard. It just is. And the lossy discard is what killed us through combinatorial versioning problems. So the idea was we'll have standard codes, we'll have domain specific codes, and, and maybe we'll map across them. How it's supposed to work? Well, standard is our common interchange. I'll always give you that library that I've never heard of that I didn't even know I was going to be linking against. We'll always exchange standard messages to you and I'll receive standard messages from other people. But that was lossy. We already discarded localized context. That was bad. So, but that was, that was the idea. And we will map to domain specific as needed. So I use other lives, which you can be generic stuff. I'll map them to my domain specific, vice versa. I am domain specific, but I have to map it lossy to a generic thing to give to someone else, the common standard thing. So uh, kind of continuing on with this, the implied mechanics is there's a finite set from the guys in torches with big brains that decided this shall be the finite set. And you got a version of that, by the way, add some, remove some, change some meaning over time. The domain specific codes, as they get mapped, it's each library author's job to map from their domain to the standard ones, and from, if you can. And we're gonna propagate standard codes everywhere. It failed because it's lossy, that's bad. Turns out surprisingly bad. And ambiguities, you, you map domain, not only is it lossy, it is going to introduce ambiguities. Some, well, this mapping from meters to yards mostly works, let's go with it. Turns out, you know, ambiguities are introduced. And it cannot scale. As you version these different libraries, the mappings get pro, um, really, really combinatorial hard. And they're, they're actually, this, the fourth one is actually the problem. There's no such thing as a common context. Yeah, the standard error codes, you know, what you did was you said, well, you're saying there's a domain called the standard domain. Everybody has the standard domain and everyone can map into the standard domain. So it's not that we have a standard you know, set of codes, you're asserting there's a standard domain. And the reality is there's no such thing as a standard domain. There are lots of domains. They are all domain specific, like by definition, that's in the name. And we have to map across them. Sorry, that may be hard. So the fail was mapping domain specific to standard and, and a lot of times vice versa. It's lossy, that's bad. We introduce ambiguities. Sometimes the mapping's close enough until it you know, becomes the point of a crash. And it can't scale because you're versioning all these things separately. And it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like an error code version of DLL hell where there's a, they, there's a versioning mismatch problem. Java lives with lots of versioning mismatch problems across their binary problems. You know, we do too. So number four, there is no common domain. And the committee, the C++ standards group, they agreed with that. In the end, we do have a generic category. It's not a common domain, it's, it's a generic domain. It's a domain that has a lot of things that seems to be commonly needed. And, and you can map to and from that domain, but it's not the one and only one standard that everybody interchanges with. It's just one domain. So, what we want really is a lot of domains to coexist peacefully in the same program. So the observation is domain specific will exist. Everybody's gonna to have to invent their own. Some contexts really are unique. Translating from one domain to another, it's lossy. It's always lossy, sorry, it's just, it's life. In reality, what users want, what libraries, authors want, what everybody wants is mapping across domains. That's, that's, that's the magic, that's the hard thing. So stood air, it preserves the context and it allows you to map across domain. That's the design. Now the handle is just the handle, it's only you know little. The error category, the error domain, the library author implements that, the library author will do these mappings. So if you have a lot of mappings, that's on the library author to make that consumable to the user. Osio did it, there are a lot of good examples of how to do it, but you have to put thought into what kind of corner cases is my library presenting to the user? That's an API, API design problem. We all know that's a hard problem. And, but that's a, that's a design problem. That's not an error code or system error problem. It just gives you a simple way to map. So, well, well how's that map work? It'd be cool if I could use, oh, I don't know, the compiler to tell me if you know, this mapping is good or bad. Perform, perform the appropriate manipulation at compile time. The compiler should take care of it for me. Static type checking is how we do it. We're C++, right? We, we have the types. Use the type system. When in doubt, the type system loves you more than anyone else. 
Air code is one type. Air condition is a different type. They're different types. Because they're different types, the type system recognizes that and it knows I'm in an error code context. What is that? Oh, it's domain specific non lossy. And it can map it to an error condition at the point of use. That's what it's doing. The APIs kind of look similar, but this is a point of use error condition. And the user doesn't even need to know about it. What is it? Well, well, really, it's two things it's an identifier, an int. You're not going to get better than an int. And it's a domain. It's a reference to some you know, logical thing that is representing the body of peers, the collection of stateful message definitions. This is a specific item within that domain. And this is a handle in context. And they're grouped. That's the handle. That's the context. And we have a lightweight value semantic thing. They're little. It's just 16 bytes. Everybody agrees. How big are they? 16 bytes. It might suspiciously look like size of int plus size of pointer. It happens to be implementation defined, but it's the int ID value and it's a reference to the domain. Now, the domain's doing the heavy lifting. So from the int identifier, I, I reference the domain, I can access all the magic goodness inside the domain. So I can say, like, do you have state? I can compute on the fly to, you know, message values. This is that implied state. So I have actual state. I have state that's kind of associated with me that's managed by the category. And then I can map to runtime even string message. OK. This is your namespace stood error code. But if you put error condition here, it's basically the same API. There's not a lot there. You don't have to know about it. There's something that'll give you the int value. Don't call it. It's there. It's for library authors, not for you. And there's a message that returns a string constructed by value on the stack. Interesting. We can do mischief with that. We can clear it. We can ask it you know, through implied operator bool if you have state or not. If it's 0 by convention, 0 is no error. And we can also get the domain. Hey, from this error, what domain are you? And it will give you back. We know domains have a name, and there's a body of stuff inside there. So defining. You will derive from error category to make your domain. And it might be a domain of codes. That's cool. A domain of conditions. You decide, either one. It's, it's, it's a minor distinction between the two, but you're just going to derive from error category, and that's how you plug in. So that's our abstract base. But you're deriving. And you know, I know that driving was the big thing in the you know, 90s. And now we're doing all this template metaprogramming stuff because we don't like to use the virtual table anymore. But this has a virtual table in it. And a virtual table is like, man, I can stick whatever I want in a derived class. I can have payloads. I can have role logs. I can put a lot of stuff in there. We're going to do mischief on that. For instantiating, you're just going to instantiate error codes. Uh, here are the categories. This is all namespace stood. You'll just create these things on the fly. I'm just going to zip through and get to the point. Oh, down, down. Uh, let's manipulate it real quick. You know, void foo will pass one in to populate, or maybe we'll return one by value. You know, how do people want to compose? Big debates on that. Maybe you want to throw or not. Debates on that too. That's API design. Stood error, you know, system error doesn't care. Do whatever you want, it supports it. So you can pass it in to be populated. You can return the value. Here I've got the no discard, which we get in C++ 17, yay us. And zero means no error. So we can conditionally process. I get an error code, if, error code. Everybody can write an if. Users can write an if. We have conditional branch logic based on whether or not there's a payload inside of you know, non-zero is returned. And there's a message associated with it. Not every error is an error. And this goes to the power of what we're trying to do. I'm going to invoke some operation from some other module maintained from who knows where. I don't know what they did. I'll get an error code back. But it's kind of like an API that returns a string. Might be an error, might be a warning, might be, you know, you can heuristically process it. Ditto an error code. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You asked me to create this directory. I failed. I'm so sorry I failed. Why? Why did you fail? Oh, because it was already there. Well, that's, that's kind of not a failure. I just want it to be there. So in this case, either I have no error because it made my directory the way I want, or it was already there, which is, I'm totally fine with already being there. I just wanted it to be there. So I can uh, conditionally walk along to my optimistic path, happy path. That, that's not an error. I'm basically testing against that error, and I'm discarding it. Now, now if it's anything other than it already existed, then, then maybe I want to handle it. I, I have a conditional branch based on that. So this, this is incredibly powerful. At runtime, what's happening is, well, 
kind of compile time, but we get an error code, we're gonna test it against this, which is compile time statically known, which will be promoted to an error code or error condition, probably an error condition, and then compared for equivalence against DC, and off we go. So exact match, exact match, equivalence, and this is why the types are different. Equivalence is when the compiler detects we're mapping from one type to another. And equivalence is how that operation occurs. Users write that, and everything the library author does is to support that operation there. That is a cross-domain map. And we can get into the detail on that, which is now. Um, I have to go fast, but uh, error code is an overloaded term. Air condition is a C++ thing that came out as, a uh, as that process. I'm not going to drill into this too much, but um, this is kind of the history of it. We're running out of time, so I want to fly. But in essence, OK, you guys are laughing. Um, we tried to do it with standard codes. It failed miserably. There was blood everywhere. And so we went to a semantic renaming where everybody can map to a common domain that's available, but mapping across domains is the goal. That's what that says. OK, so anything you want can fit in a handle in context. Inside system error, error code, stood error code. You know, our job is to populate or test against that. Grab whatever you want, stick it in error code, not hard, it's an error, you know, an int value and a domain, and you're good. And you, know, you can convert to or compare with. And this is kind of a one-way semantic flow. And the hard thing is, if you are a complicated library trying to present the user a simplified interface, yeah, yeah, it's your job to map the many, many libraries or domains upon which you're dependent to a common set of things for the user. So for example, if I want to say, hey user, low system resources, I'm struggling here. I'm gonna be thrashing soon. Well, well, what kind of errors feed into that? It's up to the library author to figure that out. Well, shoot, um, too many files open on my process, too many files open on my system, low memory. You know, you, you got like a bajillion errors that might map to low system resources if that's what you wanna to present to the user through a domain transform. So the library author will have to figure out that mapping. So what the way it's supposed to work is, Grab whatever weird thing you want and shove it into a stood error code. That's your job. It's not hard, it just has to fit into an int and a domain pointer. That's it. And domain pointer derives, well, domain pointer references your domain that derives from stood error category. That's it. So, and then you compare them. Uh, you know, it's very powerful so you can do circular loops and stuff, but generally you want that to go one way. You always want to use stood error code everywhere in all your APIs and everything because it's non lossy and it's fast and efficient. That, that really is the takeaway from today. So the concepts are simple. Include system error and use stood error code. If you want to throw, fine, throw you know, error code, system error, but it has an error code payload. So everybody's playing with error codes. So converting. Converting is lossy, but we're going to do it, especially the library developers. They're going to do it. You're going to have lazy at the point of check, open this, or you know, create this directory and lazy at the point of check, either no error or the directory was already there. I, lazy at the point of check, relied upon that conversion, that lossy conversion, because in my localized context, I can reason about that, I can maintain that. But you don't want to throw that context away early. It always, 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 so I'm going to play with, this is me being cute, category, code and conditions, you know, that's what system error gives you, prefer enums, you know, so you can create, convert, and compare amongst your category codes and conditions. And so you use the CC and C3Cs, and then you check that you do that consistently across your code base. And you know, that's best practice. That means use enums, just use enums. If you use enums, everybody can type an enum, everybody can reason about enum. The poor little compiler has to do all the work to map those cross domain mappings. This is the library developer needing to provide error codes that the users demand. So welcome library author, it's not hard. We're going to do it. We're going to write our own domain that plugs into system error just fine. It's six little steps and one of them is optional. You are here. It's not hard. What's our scale? Trivial? No, no, it's, it's hard to get trivial these days. Simple. Simple is not hard. And you know, it could be, you can do this in the morning before lunch. That's totally fine. And it's not concerning and it's not tricky. And no, no, I'm not kidding you. It's, it's, it's totally cool. You have to define any new. You're a library author, you should be able to do this. Write a switch, seems okay. Minor template metaprogramming, that's the type conversion thing. And you don't have to know anything about, you know, there's, there's copy, paste. You just do it, it's a couple lines, it's not hard. So make an enum, that's easy. Enum class my enum, some horrible thing. And 
the standard errors error C. They did a strong enum. Osio is O3 compatible. They did a weak enum, the old enum, the classic enum. You know, pick whatever works for you. Any new enum is fine. We have the type system. Your enum becomes a placeholder for a studio error condition or error code. And you know, we're just going to populate it and then check it against the enum. So generally you want to care about your enums because they have to be a, you know, understandable and everybody's going to be comparing against them. Step two, is your enum a code or condition? For the library author, this is the hardest decision to make. Hint, you know, uh, enum error C, that's an error condition, is what the decision was by the committee. You want one of these functions, you're inserting into the type system ba based on deriving from so true, whether or not your enum is a code or a condition, pick one. And for guidance, if you're a library author populating these things a lot, you're probably creating error codes. If you're a library author establishing scenarios that users will check against, you're probably condition, you know, that's a little arm wavy, we can take that offline, but this is why people have confusion in part about this topic, but error C is an error code. You're gonna derive from std error category, and it's not very big. I mean, there's not that many interface functions to do. So class my domain, I extend error category. And you're going to override, you know, hey, I'm using the new keyword. And the name of your domain, pick a name. Probably you don't want to pick a name that the standard's using, but you know, have a happy name. And then you're going to be able to want to say, given one of my enums, I want to yield or return a string. That's it. That's how we're going to map to that table. This string, and this has come up in some of the lists. Hey, hey, hey. Um, the name is returning a reference to, you know, it's a const character pointer, but the string is a fully computed message value. And, and I, I kind of like that, although the embedded kids are sad about that because this optimizes very differently, you know, for, for small footprint stuff. But essentially, because this value is, you know, a by value string can turn, you can do a lot of mischief. You can compute things on the fly, insert fields, and do all kinds of crazy manipulation, access the locale system, whatever you want to do to pick and format a string to return. So your main job as a library author is to, from your enum, yield a string. That, that's your main job. Okay, identify your domain, get my domain. There we are, it's a simple little function that returns access to my process level singleton. Good. Your domain category, it has to be a process singleton because we're cheating, like std thread is cheating. And so, you know, you can access it and I'm kind of kind of zip through. Factor creation, there's a, there's a well-known factory function called make error code. There's another one called make error condition. And, and they're gonna be one-liners, but you basically wanna do this with your enum. And, and technically, the namespace, some people are inserting into the std namespace that's allowed for system error. It allow, you know, the standards is don't insert into the, system, into the std namespace unless that's allowed by the design. In the case of system error, it's allowed by the design. But really, this just needs to be the same namespace as the one that houses your enum, and then everything should hook up. Equivalence, this is the cross-domain mapping. Do your enums map to the error C enums, the common ones? If they do, then this is your opportunity to do that mapping for free. And your implementation is gonna be given my enum, you know, case out or compare, do whatever you want, and map to std error C state not recoverable, or whatever it is that you like out of error C. Otherwise, if it doesn't map, this is the default implementation where you know, your value is preserved. Non-lossy, your value is preserved. That's it, that, that's the hardest part of writing a library and there are only six steps in. Actually, this is, you know, you can do this in 15 minutes if you really want. Wrapping custom messages. You don't actually have to define an enum. The C libraries didn't define an enum. You do have to define from, uh, derive from std error category. You're, you're overriding to get that process level context. So anytime you can shove an int in there, and tie it to your domain, you got an error code. You're good, you're good to go. And if you're gonna do this, you know, hint, hint, mischief magic, this doesn't actually have, to, if you're gonna make your own error codes this explicitly, you don't actually have to have it be a process level singleton if you do that. But, you know, I, I didn't say that out loud. Hopefully nobody saw that. Okay, using, this is the user. Users have the easiest life of all. They don't, all that stuff we went through for library authors, users know nothing of it. They don't need to know it. 
welcome user. Please use error codes. They gave them to you, the poor library author that loves you. Look at them. So, yes, you don't have to try, but if you try, it's okay that you're you know, cautious about embracing it, but it's not really as hard as workplace harassment training and certainly better than your TPS reports. You have to be able to read the list of enums the library author gave you, and reading is hard. Reading and writing is difficult, but library author. And then writing F. That's it. That's all users are supposed to know how to do. So the study error code, it's an ID and a domain. That's it. It's int and a ref. That's it. What's implied by the enum? So given the enum value, some horrible thing. Well, template metaprogramming. I know it's an enum. I know it's of this type. And through type traits and other magic, I can associate it with a domain. These are the same thing. It's a great mapping. So we get the compile time type safety, and that's how the compiler is hooking it up. Basically lightweight, little bitty template metaprogramming. So using the enum, so this is what the user is going to do. They're going to call some thing that gives them, an, gives them an error code, and they're going to compare it against the enumerated cases provided by the library author. That's it. The user doesn't have to know anything. If the user wants to populate them, they can. Essentially, EC is equal to enum value. Magically, that worked because the library author did his job. Or you just return the enum, and it'll implicitly convert. You're not going to get better than that. That's about as easy as it comes. So even users can do that. So type safety from enums. Enums awesome. So that's it. Users don't have to know very much. So sometimes there comes out this question of uh, you know, dot value. I just want the int. Yeah, but if you just grab the int, if you just grab that, that peer identifier amongst all those in the domain, you've stripped the domain. So you've got to kind of watch it. Value that member function, that's for library authors that are casing out carefully cross-domain mapping. It's not for users. So for the most part, um, error code dot value shouldn't be in your code. It should be maybe in a library developer's implementation. The user should not be doing it. So generally, we're not using switch on these things because that discards the context. So mapping across domains. This is not system error's fault. System error is giving us the absolute minimal syntax with strong static compile time type checking you can't do better than this. Oh, cross-domain mapping. Well, that, 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 that's just a problem. It's a hard problem. And the domain author mapping all these domains to your domain to prevent a simplified interface to the user, that's just something we have to do. Somebody has to use brain cells for that. So that's, that's not a system error problem. That's a mapping problem. So review, design. This is the design premise of system error. Error code is preserved, non-lossy. Coercion is at point of use, lazy. Many equivalents across many domains, that's desired, that's reality, that's what we have to live with. There's no other way to go. So responsibilities, authors have to define stuff, and equivalences, users, they don't care about really anything, they're just using names. Uh, I'm going because of time. But error category, when you define an error category, that's why I'd like it to be renamed to error domain, but it's not gonna happen. But you're defining a domain every time you derive from that, shove whatever you want in there. You have a virtual table, all the power of the universe. Many domains are interesting. Domains overlap, that's life, sorry. Equivalences are useful. That's how users are gonna do it at a higher order level comparison. They can compare low, compare high, depending on what domains they wanna play with. And equivalences, they're, they're really easy to make for the user. They're harder for the library author. Um, mapping categories is mapping across domains. So. Uh, error codes, error conditions, mapping, equivalence. I'm zipping through. Error code is equivalent. So, so here's semantically what we want. There are different domains that may be inside your error code. And, and we know that because there's a pointer to the domain inside here. And somebody's going to want to map these codes may map to try again later. And these codes from different domains may map to name not resolve. Um, I'm flying through to mostly get to the code. but Cross-domain mapping, it's a lossy transform where you can, do, you can do work discarding state, right? You can, you can raise the order of discussion. Your heuristics get to be more interesting. So for example, I want to map all of these errors to low system resources, and I want to map a subset of them to low file resources. So how many mappings would you like? Well, how would you like to compose your logic? This is a design issue for how many domains you want and how you would like to map them. System error just gives you a mechanism to do it. Essentially, you're gonna have a switch table saying, all these go that way to this conversion and a few of them go this way to that conversion. Library author has to do that. 
So implementing, implementing is not that hard. So we, we derive from error category through domain. We're implementing cross-domain mapping, right? This is for the library author. Hey, I would like to present the, unify, the user a simplified interface by hiding from the user by discarding information from the bajillion domains that I'm really resolving and retrying and maybe giving up and at some point I yield to the user a hard fail. So we have two virtual functions. You'll notice the override keyword, override keyword. One is to map your error code to other error conditions. The other is to map um, your error condition to other error codes. So generally you want this one. It, it, this is easy to do. I'm just jumping to the next page where we implement it. So this would be a platform specific mapping. So if we want equivalence to OS specific error codes, then we can stick some if defs in there. And I'm gonna use my platform specific, you know, it's inside my system category, my platform specific codes that I'm testing against. Maybe they don't even exist on other platforms. And I will compare whatever code I'm given to that platform specific one and insert all my FDFs for all my platforms, and there's my cross-domain mapping, and that works. If you don't want to go platform specific, I'm going to roll to the next slide. We can do equivalence across domains that are not platform specific. So for example, given your enum, you can kind of map it to any of these standard errors. I'm going to map that up to, you know, equivalent to my low system resources. And anyway, this is, this is actually coming a lot of this. Uh, these examples are derived from Chris's blog post on that. I'll have a link on that in a second. So I'm, I've got to run for the purposes of time, but this cross-domain mapping is only for library authors and it's brain cells because you're presenting an abstraction. So the fact that it's a complicated thing has nothing to do with system error. It has to deal with cross-domain mapping. So review, system error. Category, you derive from it because you're a library author and you want a domain. Error code, everybody and their brother uses that one. You catch them, you receive them, you sniff them, you compare them against the names. Air condition, library authors may care about that. Users have no idea that thing even exists. These happen to look very similar. Almost always you're playing with error code. System error, that's if you want to throw an error code payload. And error C, well, that's just a strong enum that you can just use right now out of the box. You know, return error C some value. Or, or is this error that I received this error C value? It'll just work. It's ready to go now. You don't have to write any code at all. So for users, you stood error code, that's it. Just use enums, you're done. Um, it's not const expert. I would like it to be const expert. It could be const expert. It's not today. Library implementers. This is, these are six steps of which the last is optional. Make it enum, not hard. One of, you're a code or a condition. Drive, access, here's your singleton function. Enable, factory creation, that's it. So this is not hard. You know, you can do it in 15 minutes, certainly before lunch. Learn more. So um, Chris, who had a big handle in this, uh, you know, he has really good blog posts going through this. Um, here's another comment by another author. He's often on the, boot, on the boost mailing list. He, he's used it. He likes it. He's found it useful for a lot of ways. He's got a technique which is referenced here, and I'm coming up on the next slide for um, wrapping C error codes. Using system error, establishing domain boundary, it's documentation because your enums are the set of finite conditions by which the user can reason about the behavior of your system. Optimistic path, negative path, conditional branching based on what the library author provided to the user for reasoning. So it's a documentation mechanism like, like most enums are. But it's also our payload, our payload across API boundaries. You can wrap it in higher level things, but error code is a handle in context, you know, reference to peer within a process level singleton that's non-lossy that at point of use, we will drop and do a lossy convert to a high level heuristic. Okay, so uh, one of the reasons that underscores that is error codes stream this to standard out, but error conditions don't, that operator isn't overloaded. So you'll get the category name and then the error value, uh, whereas if you do it to error condition, you just get a compiler. No, you can't do that. Use error code everywhere. If you forget, you get a compiler when you try to stream it. So use standard error, error code that should say. See rule number one, don't use error conditioning APIs. Um, error code, error code, error code, <coughs> error code, error code. Uh, this was a thought exercise which you don't have time for why you might want to use the error condition. If, if you have a design scenario by which you would like to transform to a higher level context intentionally, I want to throw away state intentionally, you, you want to like map across domains intentionally ahead of time, discarding state, then you might think about using error condition. It turns out, and we're going to skip through the slides, that that's really kind of 
theoretically a nice idea, but in reality it doesn't happen. Um, it, it, you know, we'll sometimes do it. You know, you might want to have this and that and pros and cons, and here's how it would physically work. But this is this is kind of a parallel. If you caught one exception type and you threw a different exception type, that would be an example of that cross-domain transform. Why didn't you throw the exception you received? Well, because I'm being nice to the user, I'm transforming it to something at a, at a better level that the user can reason about. So we might catch one type and throw another type as a cross-domain mapping. That's a loss to transform. This design would serve the same purpose. Um, and this is basically saying you probably don't want to do that most of the time. Um, it's cheap and fast, everything's great, do what works for you. So um, you probably are not going to return them by const reference because, you know, is it a global, is it a static? You can probably return them by value, of course. You can pass it in by ref to be populated, that's fine. You can pass it in not at all and then just throw. You can throw a system error which has an error code payload, that's fine. You can do the callback thing where you're, you're calling back a value or a reference or constant reference maybe to the value. Uh, Osio tends to pass back the ref. There's some tricks you can do with the ref. Like, you know, it's, it's you know, one definition rule. You can do, you know, kind of tricky little things. But um, I, I think that was just kind of habit there. Uh, there are compositional, std optional is showing up and std exceptional is, you know, on the track for C++ 20. Std, um, or expected, I'm sorry. Stood expected is a generalization of stood optional. So we'll talk about that here in a second, but um, you might compose error codes inside these higher order types. So if you have, I want to get my T back, or, or if not a T, then I should get an error code, or, or if not an error code, maybe I should get an exception back, you know, and that's all the stuff I might possibly get back, and I want to reason about that. As a library author, you may want to reason at that level to provide non-throwing APIs over a throwing interface. So wrapping error code, what are people doing? Um, they're using it out of the box as design. It's not really that hard to do. Library authors have to do a little bit of work, but you can color outside the lines. Why? Well, you know, you got this like hidden context that you can do mischief with. And we're creating an error message on the fly based on whatever local reasoning and maybe set process locale we have. So we can wrap C library stuff that's, that's actually kind of being used as design, but I put it in here anyway. Unifying error codes bridging from the old boost error codes to std error code. And uh, outcome is a is a library. Actually, that's a, up for boost review end of this week, and it'll go on for ten days. So you might want to have a look at that. And then um, some other stuff with structured logging, instance specific field values formatted into that string. Do real mischief. I want instance specific values formatted in my message. So that's kind of the fourth one. It's coloring outside the lines. It's an abuse. So C libraries. I don't have time to go through this, but you know this is basically what he's doing. There's a GitHub link pulled there, but as it turns out, two days ago he posted. You know this is kind of the attributes of that. He posted this a couple days ago, and this is a summary of that technique. So just go to his blog and read it. It's very good. Um, here's another comment he had in there. Uh, this is in reference to another blog post of mapping boost error code to std error code. So that's a good one. He explains the rationale for why you might want to do that. Design's absolutely consistent with system, er system error. Um, this is boost outcome. It's up for boost review end of this week. And it's a unified error handling system. And, and this is really the, this is the message here. This is the takeaway. Stood option, we have that now in C++ 17. And oh, I'm sorry, um, should it be optional? Yeah. Oh, oops, okay. Optional. Uh, expected is a generalization. What, they, what he's doing, uh, he's got an expected implementation inside this library because we don't have expected yet. But uh, there's an implementation in there, but I want an empty or a T, an empty or a T, or an error code, an empty or a T, or an error code, or an exception pointer, and that's to wrap up throwing and non-throwing APIs. So you can kind of dig in and have a look at that. I, I, I recommend everybody go have a look at the library. Interesting thoughts there. Um, we came to similar conclusions for different reasons. What he's doing in there is a little bit it did not occur to me. He's doing this. Um, this is by Niall in the Outcome Library. Error code extended, he extends std error code, and he's adding payload for instance specific context. And this mechanism, which turns out it works, um, it's extending to allow the user to apply context in the error code itself. So our lightweight handle, it's, it's kind of a little heavier handle, but it's safe slices back to the lightweight handle, which is interesting. Did not occur to me. And there's a little bit of back, uh, backtrace stuff in there. You can chain error code. So that was an interesting color outside the lines of std error code. Um, he's the only one I've seen do that. And that's in the outcome line. Um, 
here's a talk on that he did a few weeks ago at uh, ACCU, and it's a really good talk. You know, everybody should go look at it. And this uh, dirty, dirty. These are um, functionally impure monads that are consistent with C++ paradigms. That's the name of the talk. But it, it really talks about error handling. That's what it's about. Okay, so um, this is kind of the other coloring outside the lines. I'll just kind of mention because you can screw around with it. I'm, I'm, I'm playing with this. And you can have custom error types that carry payload. You just have to move the payload into the context, into that you know, process-specific singleton. It's an abuse, but essentially the error category is now tracking extra payload for structured logging instance-specific messages because that lets me do this. So I want this message with these fields, and I want to ship that off. And that goes into the context as the payload. The handles are still light, so it's just an int and a ref. The, the payload is inside the context. So I can get it, I can do it, and I can spit it out, and it'll format all your fields in there. And then you can, you can, you can go nuts with this. I mean, you do localization, you do all kinds of transforms of, of structured logging. And you know, here's kind of the object diagram, but, but you know, I'll zip through because the next slide's more interesting. But I just derive error category like everybody's supposed to do, and then I just have some message definitions and instances, and, and here's how they use them. So in the instance, when you have an error code, it's just your int and your reference to the domain, like everybody else. Everybody's doing the same thing, passing around by value. It's just that the handle goes into the category which has the structured logging field-specific instance value that is mapped to essentially your format string, right? This is the definition of the error. So now you can have inserted field-specific messages still passed around by value. It's just a handling context pattern. Well, I would have coded this manually if I didn't have system error. System error just having to do the same thing I would have done. So um, it has a message schema and instances and localization. It's, it's kind of useful for stuff like a logging framework. It's kind of like an opt-in stack trace. It's not a real stack trace, but kind of like an opt-in one. The hard part is this. Your instance-specific state, you have to manage it. That's all. It's in the context. You have to, you have to manage it or decay it or you know, obsolete it eventually. So recommendations. So we'll just close out because we're running out of time. <sighs> Use the type system. Use enums. It just makes life better. The C kids won't do that, but you know, we will because we like the enums. Don't call value because that strips the domain. Library authors may as they're mapping across domains, but users shouldn't be doing that. If you just use enums and manipulating your if expression, you cannot go wrong. The type system totally has your back. If it didn't work, it's because the library author did not map across domains. Error code, it's platform specific. We will lazy transform that to a higher level context if we want. Error condition, it's platform independent. It's maybe a case we test against. I do actually envision a scenario where you could probably evolve this library to ditch error condition entirely. Um, there's been some offline discussion about that. Um, Categories define your domain, library authors, it's kind of your job. Each module is probably going to have one or more domains. If you can use the standard one, use the standard one. Otherwise, a lot of times you have your own local specific domains you have to do. Generic category exists. That is the cross-platform generic set of messages. They're the POSIX error messages. But Windows maps to them, Linux maps to them, everybody maps to them if you can. And by general, if you, if you create a new domain, the, the library author will probably map to them. That's that big list of error no values that we already know about. So you probably want to use that unless you really want to define your own domain. Oops, down, down. Um, system category, that's your platform specific one. Your OS vendor, your platform vendor will give you specific codes maybe to test against if you really want to compare against that. And um, just map to the common plat cross-platform one if you can. That's not the universal set. That's just a common domain that happens to be available. As user, use the enums. And that's pretty much it. Be aware that they're converted, maybe. Maybe you don't have to be aware of anything. Um, don't call value. And users, and, and this, is, this is opinion, but users really are to be completely forgiven if they don't know anything other than error code. They should know enums and error code and nothing else. Library authors, they define domains. That's harder. As author, use the error code, never error condition, strong enums, weak enums, pick an enum. Do the domain mapping if you can, that's a hard problem. Just, just you know, set theory is hard, sorry. It's your functions, um, you kind of have to document what you provide to the user. And then, you know, you should convert to the common ones if you can. This is a public service announcement, I'm just gonna fly through here real quick. Um, 
Bad messages are in all systems everywhere, but you're the coder and we often type the literal strings right there and just word to the wise, watch what you type. So do write, don't write bad, don't. I said do write, don't write bad, do write good. Bad, it's not hard and I've got some examples, but I'll just flip down to the one that, um, okay, here we go. If this threshold is exceeded, the user is too blankety blank stupid to run this program. And you would think developers wouldn't write that. They're professionals. Um, two days, two days, it was found in the field. The customer had just upgraded a million dollar instrument. Hotfix patch to the entire field. Turns out that that stops things for a while. Developer did have to place a phone call. And um, all messages are eventually seen. That's why we sometimes see those messages. The user should never see this message. All messages are eventually seen. And corner cases are more common than you think. And your developer assumptions are often violated sometimes, sometimes for legitimate reasons. So have a little empathy and sympathy in composing a polite error message where the user may not actually be batshit insane. Or, or have a big checkbook, either one. Um, good messages, I just want to give you the one thing, have content consumable, but this is, this is the one thing, which is four things, because they lie. Where it came from, what condition occurred, how the system responded, what the user should do. That's a good message. That doesn't have to be a book. That, that can be one sentence. It's totally fine. And users get confused when you don't give this, but you need for diagnosis reasons, you need that. Occasionally you can admit one, but usually you don't. And, and these are examples of good messages. They're not big. Those are good messages. So you can kind of look at that on your own. Um, that's it. I want to thank... Um, Jesse Oberreuter, she's a brilliant engineer I get to work with and, and I talked to her a little bit about, about this stuff in um, Bjorn Reese offline. He had some blog posts in here and he's done a lot of work with, with uh, System Error. Uh, Niall Douglas, he's author of the Boost Outcome Library. It's up for review end of this week. So he has some interesting stuff there. And Chris Kohlhoff, of course, he's got that uh, blog series post, one, two, three, four, five. You had the links back there. You might want to review that too. Uh, a lot of this uh, stuff was inspired by, by his work. And, and that's kind of it. So the takeaways are system error, little header, cheap, not hard to use, cross module, cross boundary, cross API, value semantics, manipulation, non-lossy. You can write it yourself, but you're probably going to write a handle in context in the end. And, and that's all it is. It's nothing other than that. Bring your own logging system and do great mischief inside error category if you want. But um, it, it's really not that hard to fit in your brain. And as a community, we don't really have good cross system error messages and format. Oh yeah, we do. It's in the standard. It's system error and it's not hard. And um, the, the last little thing which I'll leave you, if you have and you probably do, one, two, three, four, five different error subsystems in your code. You don't have to rewrite all of it. All you have to do is map that to a handling context. Map that to a domain and an int handle within the domain. So all the existing error subsystems in the wild, and there's a bajillion of them, probably in the same code base, they all map into this really, really not hard. So in the end, that's it. Thoughts. No thoughts. Well, you hated it. Here's the <laughs> oh. uh, when, uh, when you define a fallback, when you have a fallback in your case, and you mentioned that Chris likes adding constant percent mm -hmm. to the system error version. Yeah, which I know. Code. Yeah. And uh, it seems like if we extend system error to carry extra payload information, then uh, the Chris's version actually, where you can rely on that extra information that they did during the slicing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the comment, and I agree with it, it's, it's a surprise to me because I never thought about extending error code, but the comment was, if you return by ref instead of by value in error code, the by value, if somebody crazy like boost outcome derived from error code and had more payload, that would have been sliced away, in this case, safely sliced. Biasing your implementation to return by ref or pass by ref would skip the slicing and that might be more future safe, or, or if you wanted to use library more, and I agree. I tend to do the ref thing. I know for compiler optimization, the current goal is, is by value thing, and I know it's a point of hot debate, which is why well, I've reluctantly expressed an opinion, but it is true that 
Returning by ref is forward safe if somebody chose to derive from error code. Outcome is an example. You could do that. And I a little bit thought about that with structured logging, instance specific field values. In the end, I shipped it all off the context. But um, yeah, I, I would say I don't have a recommendation, but if the recommendation were made, I would return by pass by ref, return by ref. I tend to always go by ref. Stuff goes in line so that the compiler can see it. But I tend to not, even though they're little, I still don't want those constructors to fire, even though they should get elided out. I just don't know. So I, I do think that's a good observation. Um, Ozio returns by ref, passes in by ref, callbacks by ref. And I just say, well, I just do what Ozio did. And that is safe, slice safe. Any, any other thoughts? Anybody else using it, playing with it at all? Okay, so there's some, yeah. Okay. Ah, yes. Because, because it's, you, you can control that slicing. Yeah, okay, so the, so the comment, which is, I think, a very valid comment is, instance-specific state is often required. They extend it or they, they, they try to derive from error code, but slicing occurred because somebody somewhere did a pass by value. And in the end, it was easier just to define a new error type where a data member was error code and data members also were the instance-specific state because then it's just one type, no slicing. And you can pass by value or ref, no slicing. So, so yeah. The, the bad thing is that you need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, and the comment is you reinvent the wheel as a result. Yeah, so the, the, the color outside the lines that I had where it shoved all the state into the context, it does not have that problem. You just have to decay it. You know, if you have an infinite number of messages, at some point you have to start pruning. And there, there are tricks for that. But... That's investing in that centralized context as opposed to the instance specific context. So um, my only observation on that would be if it's single threaded and you want your own error type with an error code and instance specific values and it has a life cycle that you can predict and then it terminates and you're good, you're good. People are doing that, I have no problem with that. Error code is a payload, it's a value. That, at least you're using it. The downside is the state, the value of that object once you get cross threads, you're distributing across the API the responsibility, the onus on the users to understand when is, you know, when is its life cycle over. So you either distrib you distribute that responsibility to the instance, the error code instance itself, or you centralize it to the context. And both of them have good and bad. So I, I don't have a good answer on that. It, it, it is conceivable that that design decision of instance-specific state is so important, and the committee took a pass on it. They knew there was a need for instance-specific state. They took a pass on localization and instance-specific state and, and, and several things because they wanted to put the footprint in there and they would maybe extend it later. We may want another type, maybe with a virtual table, that has instance-specific state that we can pass around, but we won't be able at that point to pass by ref or by value because it would slice, we'd have to pass by ref. So um, the bespoke error codes that we do now, which is a, an API or, or domain specific type used within that domain with a cross domain mapping, we're all doing it now because of the instance specific. The committee is currently silent on that. So the design may eventually give us one that we could all use, that, that might be nice. Um, but you can get by without it if you shove it into the context. So. Yeah, it's, it's a hard problem. And once you get to threading and cross-process, you know, life cycle gets to be weird. Yeah. Sorry, another question. Maybe I missed something. Uh, how about combining HPD, uh, error code, and boost error code? Because it's a different process. Yeah, so, yeah, so the question is, uh, how about combining the boost error code and the STD error code? And you you map them. You, you, you can't... Well, the guidance is you should map from one domain to the other. Bjorn Rees, he has a blog post on exactly that. 
Now in new code, he recommends using std error code because uh, you don't need the boost one, just go to the std one because all the libraries, the standard libraries, especially the file system networking TSs, other libraries are coming in with more std error code. So you won't want to use the boost one if you're on 11 or beyond. But the cross domain mapping works fine and he's using it and the blog post was explaining how. Uh, a couple little tricks in there, no big deal. It's just the standard cross domain mapping. You're mapping from the boost error code to the std error code. And, and you'll do a similar thing if you have my proprietary error code to a std error code. You're gonna do the same mapping. You know, derive from category, override this, you establish equivalence, and you're done. So, um, yeah, the cross domain mapping is set theory. And, and it's, it's more than that, it's, it's domain logical heuristic mapping theory. You know, what level does the user want to think? You know, high level heuristics simple, low level heuristics detail with more verbose output to system engineers. That's the hard problem. You'll need a design for it. This one's, you know, as good as any. You're not gonna get better in your noons. So, any other, any other thoughts? Okay, thank you. Thank you.